morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming and attending our symposium. Uh, it has been a year in the making for me. I'm Sandy Newcomb, the symposium editor. Um, but again, thank you. I also want to thank um, Commercial Bank, who sponsored our breakfast this morning. Mr. Lowry, thank you, wherever you are. Um, but I get to introduce uh, Mr. Stephen Bush this morning. Uh, Mr. Stephen Bush is the 10th uh, Chief Public Defender for Shelby County, and he directs the largest and uh, oldest public defense system in Tennessee. He is a principal architect of the Jericho Project, a national jail diversion model for detainees with serious mental illness and substance use disorders, for which he received the 2010 Frank G. Clement Award for Community Service from the Tennessee Association of Mental Health Organizations. Mr. Bush serves on the American Council of Chief Defenders, Operation Safe Community. He is also on the Operation Safe Community Board of Directors and is a fellow of the Memphis Bar Foundation. Uh, Mr. Bush frequently speaks in national criminal justice behavioral health uh, venues, including the conference by the National Legal Aid and Defenders Association, the Council of State Governments, the National Gain Center the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and the Bazion Center for Mental Health Law. He's a graduate of our law school and also Millsap College. Um, he's a very busy man, undertaking a lot of different roles right now, and we really appreciate your support for the symposium and then also the work that you're doing here in our community. So Mr. Bush will be speaking um, on the need for independent, ethical, and zealous advocates for all children in Memphis and Shelby County. So, Mr. Bush. I'm going to walk up there slowly and plug my computer in. Okay. I think so. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Test. Good morning, and thank you, Sandy, and everyone. It is an honor to be back at the University of Memphis. Um, the last time I spent this much time with the Law Review, <laughs> I was dating the Law Review. <laughs> but we've enjoyed the interaction and the adventure of preparing for this, and I'm happy to be here today. The Shelby County Public Defender has been around for quite a long time. But we haven't provided direct services in juvenile court for more than 35 years. Under this agreement, that will change, and it is our task to ensure that due process is met for all children through rigorous challenge to the state's evidence in every case. We think that this is an essential part of the process and that by doing it in a way that is independent and ethical and zealous, that it will go a long way toward assuring the integrity of our juvenile justice system for now and for generations to come. We will defend the, dig the rights and dignity of children by providing and supporting independent, ethical, zealous, holistic, client-directed, trauma-informed legal representation. We will win strong legal and life outcomes for Shelby County's children by minimizing harmful involvement in the justice system and advocating for supports and opportunities that children need to thrive in their own homes, families, and communities. We will empower children 
their families, and our community through a community-oriented defense practice that responds to local needs, goals, and concerns. And we will promote the evolution of a fair and compassionate justice system through partnerships for policy reform advocacy both here and across the state. If I'm dull, this is a shameless plug. <laughs> we would like for you who are interested to be aware that you can follow our work in this area and in other areas. And um, shameless plug. Let's start here. The right to counsel is not a formality. It is not a grudging gesture to a ritualistic requirement. It is of the essence of justice. With these words, Supreme Court Justice Fortas tipped the scales in writing for a five to four majority in Kent versus United States, changed history and set in motion modern juvenile justice jurisprudence. Decision after decision, it ignited juvenile justice reform that's been underway in other places for the better part of two decades. From a call for justice forward, with deep investment from the federal government through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and private investment through the Casey Foundation and MacArthur and others, all of this has led us to this point where with this unprecedented action by the Department of Justice, to see if this type of leverage can accelerate meaningful juvenile justice reform here in Memphis. I'm going to back up and do some history for a minute because I think it's important to put this into context. But the work here is important and people are watching. Some history you may not know. Abe Fortas was born in South Memphis in 1910, the same year that our juvenile court was founded. His childhood home was under a parking lot out here next to the FedEx Forum. The son of Orthodox Jewish immigrants, the youngest of five children, Fortas was serious and smart and hardworking. He graduated at 16 from Memphis Public Schools. He won a scholarship to Southwestern at Memphis, now Rhodes College. By 19, he had completed his undergraduate degree in political science at the top of his class. He earned a scholarship to Yale Law School. He would graduate second there. He stayed as a professor. His future was bright. He was also quite the musician. He cut his teeth playing on Beale Street. Uh, and his love and skill with the violin and other instruments carried forward throughout his life and he was part of the infamous in-street, strictly no-refund string quartet as an accomplished D.C. lawyer. He took his first government position as an advisor to the Securities and Exchange Commission. He served as undersecretary to the U.S. Department of Interior. In 1946, he founded a small law firm called Arnold Fortas and Porter. He helped establish the U.N. He was a jurist on the Warren Court. He litigated the Durham case that confronted the McNaughton rule. He was a trusted advisor to a U.S. president, but it was the case of a small town drifter that would make Fortas the primary architect of the American public defense system. In 1917, when Abe was in second grade, a murder trial in Memphis set in motion events that embedded in the DNA of this community a radical idea that all persons facing a loss of liberty, regardless of wealth, have the right to counsel. Here's what happened. In Dyer County, a black man was accused of killing a white woman. The racially charged case was moved to Memphis seeking a fair trial venue. I think that's cool that a case came to Memphis seeking a fair venue in a case like this. A young lawyer who was also a state representative named Samuel Bates was appointed to represent the defendant in this capital case. That's what the right to counsel meant in 1917. You could have a lawyer appointed if you were facing the death penalty. It didn't mean much more than that in state and local courts at the time. So struck by the circumstances of his client, 
Mr. Bates reached deep into his own pocket to investigate the crime and to discover the proof that the police in Dyer County could not or would not find that the woman was indeed killed by her white husband. Imagine that. Mr. Bates defended his client in the brand new Shelby County Courthouse and his client was acquitted. That's not the end of the story. Marked by this experience, Mr. Bates returned to Nashville, this time as a state senator, and initiated the private act that established the first public defender's office this side of California in 1917. The right to counsel has been essential to justice here for a very long time. Imagine that. Right here in this rough, gritty river city, in the early 1900s, the people of Memphis were at the vanguard and knew that if you faced a loss of liberty, no matter who you were, your wealth, your race, your circumstances, you had the right to an attorney. How cool is that? There was another child born in 1910 this one in Missouri. Things appear to have started okay for Clarence Earl Gideon. He's shown here receiving his perfect attendance pen for Sunday school. But divorce and a fractured family and poverty took a toll. He dropped out of school. Clarence was first locked up when his mother reported him as a runaway. He was 13, barely literate. Throughout his life, Mr. Gideon cycled in and out of jails and prisons, mostly for petty crimes. Fast forward to 1961, to a seedy pool hall in Panama City, Florida, where someone broke in and stole $65 in change from the jukebox and the vending machines, plus 12 beers and 12 Cokes and four bottles of cheap wine. Someone claimed he saw Mr. Gideon walking nearby with a pocket full of change. Walking, no sign of the beers or the wine. But he was no stranger to law enforcement in the area and he was arrested and charged. He repeatedly asked for a court appointed attorney because he could not afford one. He said, this is not fair. I can't represent myself. He claimed again and again that he could not get a fair trial without a lawyer. His request was denied. Armed with his middle school education, he was forced to defend himself. He lost and was sentenced for five years for that pocket of change. From his Florida prison cell, Gideon filed a handwritten petition arguing the lack of an appointed attorney was unfair, unconstitutional, and the Florida Supreme Court said no, it's not a capital case, no right to an attorney. But remarkably, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear the petition and appointed now quite prominent Washington, D.C. lawyer Abe Fortas to argue Mr. Gideon's case. I'm not naive. The writing was on the wall. This appointment was a vehicle for sure. But in 1963, in Gideon v. Wainwright, the Supreme Court declared the right to a lawyer to be fundamental and essential to fairness in criminal court proceedings and held that lawyers must be provided to defendants who could not afford them so that every person stands equal before the law. In 1963, the Supreme Court ruling was hailed internationally as a watershed moment for the cause of justice. The Supreme Court reached this ruling a mere 46 years after the right to counsel was assured for poor citizens in Shelby County. I've often wondered in the wake of the DOJ investigation and in our efforts to prepare for this work, uh, how growing up in this community shaped Dave Fortas as he moved forward to argue for Mr. Gideon. By 1965, now Associate Justice Fortas, he provided the fifth vote that extended the right to counsel to children in the Kent decision that we started with, declaring that the essence of justice was carved into American jurisprudence for children for all time. As he argued so clearly in Gideon and declared so loudly in Kent, if there was any remaining doubt, 
It was put to rest in 1967. A juvenile needs the assistance of counsel to cope with problems of law, to make skilled inquiry into facts, to insist upon the regularity of the proceedings, and to ascertain whether the child has a defense and to prepare and to present it. The child requires the guiding hand of counsel at every step in the proceedings against him. The assistance of counsel is essential. Let's just take a moment and breathe deeply with those words from those opinions. The right to counsel looked good in the 60s. There was great hope. Boom. Since then, the size and scope of the criminal justice system in this country have no parallel in history. We have 5% of the world's population, but we now incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoners. The U.S. boasts an incarceration rate that's 10 times higher than other industrialized nations. We lock up 1 in 100 citizens. This is a tenfold expansion in less than four decades. No one's even close. Today, one in 30 men between the ages of 20 and 34 is behind bars. For African Americans in the same age range, it's one in nine. What that means today is that one in three black children will serve time compared to children that look like me, one in 29. Without question, racial disparities are the defining feature of the American criminal justice system. But it's not race that dictates the outcome of a criminal prosecution. What dictates the outcome is wealth. Thank you for hanging with me as I ran through the history, but context is important to what we're doing here. Report after report after report has documented the decline of the right to counsel in the wake of Gideon to now. To the point that last year, the U.S. Attorney General, marking the 50th anniversary of the Gideon decision, said this, far too many Americans struggle to gain access to the legal assistance they need, and far too many children and adults routinely enter our juvenile and criminal justice systems with little understanding of the rights to which they are entitled, the charges against them, or the potential sentences that they may face. In short, America's indigent defense systems exist in a state of crisis. A state of crisis. More recently, he went on to say that despite the basic promise of Gideon, that the day has not arrived when all of our citizens can access legal help without having to wait, to sacrifice, or to worry, this is unconscionable. As we stand here, 50 years away from these great decisions in this beautiful space, I'm reminded of another jail cell where another prisoner was writing in 1963 the words of oppression. In his letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. King said this, law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice. When they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. We fail in the purpose of establishing justice when race has become the defining characteristic of the American criminal justice system. We fail when wealth and not race determines the outcome of criminal prosecution. We fail when the time served marks only the first step of a lifetime of consequences and when the politics of fear and anger cloud justice reform that's driven by research and science, where the complexities of poverty, trauma, and scarcity of resources result in no options. All of this for context, all of this for background. Despite the early promise of public defense in Shelby County, we've suffered the same challenges that every defender system as in urban areas across the country. Over the last 20 years, our workload has doubled and our staffing has increased by 9%. 
And that's where we were when the investigation landed with the call for the public defender to return to juvenile court. The DOJ findings are stark, but we need to be clear. The Department of Justice expects to make these same findings in systems, in urban, justice, urban juvenile justice systems across the country. Be sure the nation is watching what we do here. Under the Memorandum of Agreement, Shelby County government shall take action to ensure independent, ethical, zealous advocacy by the juvenile defenders representing children in delinquency hearings. The agreement creates a responsibility for the supervision and oversight of juvenile delinquency representation to the public defender's office and ensures that the juvenile defenders have appropriate administrative support, reasonable workloads, and sufficient resources to provide independent, ethical, and zealous representation. That poetry is throughout the memorandum of agreement, and it is the challenge that we face. The action includes supporting the development of a specialized public defender unit for juvenile defense, and also requires the court to establish a juvenile defender panel overseen by an independent body to handle matters where representation involves a conflict of interest or is necessary to assure workload control. Under the agreement, representation of children shall cover all stages of the juvenile delinquency case, pre-adjudicatory pre investigation, litigation, dispositional advocacy, and post-dispositional advocacy for as long as the juvenile court has jurisdiction over the child. The representation expected under the agreement is much broader than any that's ever been provided here. Uh, it is in line with national standards. The agreement requires attorney practice standards for the defenders. It requires support for the training of the defenders. There is no waiver of any right by a child in juvenile court without the advice of counsel. And under the agreement, all children are presumed indigent. This is the largest, largest poor metropolitan city in the country. It is frequently cited as one of the most dangerous communities in the nation. Our schools are in a state of complex transition. 11,000 children a year hit our juvenile justice system. Under the agreement, 9,000 now require counsel under the terms of the memorandum of agreement. Most of them are already survivors of violence and trauma. Most of them are growing up in a precarious world marked by deep poverty, not first generation, but second and third generation poverty. We must acknowledge the complex forces that are driving the stark racial disparities that are here and have the courage to ask the hard questions, why? We're not starting from scratch. We benefit from the deep investment in juvenile justice reform. The court's early embrace of the Casey Foundation's uh, work was important and has resulted in important strides. And we've all benefited from the MacArthur Foundation's deep investment in the Comprehensive Models for Change initiative. The Models for Change initiative is grounded in a commitment that there should be a separate justice system for youth that is responsive to their developmental needs and focused on their practical rehabilitation, seeks to harness and to direct local reform work and to catalyze change across the nation. MacArthur's portfolio is a sprawling amount of deep experimentation, innovation, research, and development, and we will mine it for what we do here. As a part of the MacArthur investment, a lot of work has been done to build a capacity and sufficiency in juvenile defender systems. The National Juvenile Defender Center has been the lead agency for uh, the last decade in pursuing these, and with MacArthur's uh, resources, this year, they, they published the National Juvenile Defense Standards. With the standards, the Companion Juvenile Training Immersion Program uh, was put out. These standards and this training set forth a framework for representation that is client-centered and anchored in law, science, and in professional codes of responsibility. They provide a roadmap for counsel to navigate every stage of the juvenile delinquency practice from detention, 
through post-disposition representation and inform the role of defender in addressing systemic deficiencies. These standards provide a practical approach to systemizing competent and diligent juvenile defense practice and reflect a core commitment to the unique role of the juvenile defender. Today, the representation of children in delinquency proceedings is a highly specialized practice of law. It is different from, but equally as important as the representation of adults in criminal proceedings. Delinquency cases are complex and their consequences have significant implications for children and families. But juvenile defenders owe their clients the same ethical obligations that adult criminal clients enjoy, and this duty of loyalty requires the juvenile defender to advocate for the child's expressed interests with the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation. In December, I laid out the framework and a timeline for the construction of a specialized juvenile public defender system that has the resources, skills, and commitment necessary to win these strong legal and life outcomes for our children. We are building a specialized juvenile defender unit within the public defender system, but we do not have the resources to provide high quality delinquency representation to every child in Shelby County through the public defender's office. We will instead build an infrastructure to support and to hold accountable a unified juvenile defense bar comprised of public defenders and defenders who are appointed from a panel of qualified private lawyers. We envision a juvenile defense system that is rooted deeply in these nationally recognized best practices, but that also builds on local assets and responds to local needs. A system of independent, ethical, and zealous advocacy that protects the rights of every child in Shelby County today and for the next generation. To do this, to build a unified juvenile defender bar, public defender and private counsel uh, will take an enormous amount of work. We will build a shared infrastructure to support both the public defenders and private counsel. The practice, substantively, will be holistic, client-oriented, and cross-disciplinary. Why? Because that's what works. That's what begins to turn the, the tide. We all benefit from an increasingly successful juvenile justice system where the kids bumping up against the court ultimately return to school and go forward in our community. Accountability will come through adherence to best practice standards tailored for us here in Shelby County and ultimately across the state. We will be active in community engagement. This means listening to our clients, their families and communities, and to other justice system stakeholders. It also means public education and systems change work that empowers our clients and creates the community-based supports that children need to thrive. Even as we work to defend individual children, we must also work for systemic juvenile justice reform and that work is just beginning. It will take time, and it will be going for a long time. Our internal juvenile defender unit will be a specialized practice with dedicated staffing and its own hiring process. It will not be a stepchild of the adult criminal justice practice. We can't let the challenges facing big PD impede our progress in juvenile court. We hope our juvenile defense unit will someday provide a model for the rest of public defense here in Shelby County in terms of staffing supports and resources. The cross-disciplinary approach will engage social workers, education advocates, appellate lawyers, investigators, and other specialists alongside attorneys to help clients succeed in court, in school, in life. We will extensively train on the use of experts and we will support defenders in the use of these experts at every stage. Over the course of this year, we will develop practice standards and meaningful workload controls that assure quality advocacy. And we will monitor staff workload through careful supervision and through a new high-functioning case management system. During the first year of practice, we will adapt the NDJC standards to our local systems and our, lo and our clients' needs here in Memphis. 
as we create a truly specialized set of standards that define best practices in juvenile defense for use here in Memphis. Embedded in all of this is an opportunity for an academic partnership. A collaboration between the University of Memphis and the Shelby County's Public Defender's Office and the rest of the juvenile justice system that can train a new generation of juvenile defenders that can validate and promote best practices in juvenile defense by modeling and lending academic credibility to zealous client-directed advocacy that can help drive positive law change and systems reform here in Nashville and further by dedicating resources to the litigation of complex and recurring issues and by helping us focus on specific vulnerable children that we represent that may be beyond the capacity of the private bar or the public defender. The research is clear. The vast majority of children involved in the justice system have survived exposure to violence and are living with the trauma of that experience. There is already deep work underway in this community led by the Urban Child Institute and multiple others. There's a great deal of focus on the ACE report, the Adverse Childhood Experiences reports. We must connect the dots. We must make sure that everything we're doing to represent clients and as they are adjudicated through our ju juvenile justice system is connected to all of the other deep and good work underway in this community that's addressing infant mortality, early childhood success, and the adventure of our merged school systems. So, a highly specialized juvenile defense bar anchored by a dedicated public defender core in full partnership with an increasingly strengthened private bar. This will not be easy. This work is not for the meek. We have to confront the hard realities. Workload control in a state that has none, either by statute or Supreme Court edict. Standards-based practice in a state that has none. Sustainability in a system that lacks independence. The DOJ findings were frank in their depiction of the lack of judicial independence in the court system. There are deficits in independence in how public defense is delivered here, and there are deep deficits in independence in how Supreme Court Rule 13 is structured that I think are at the heart of a lot of the problems that the DOJ was reporting on. Folks, we are in a low services state. Chronic underfunding in adult and juvenile defender systems here is the norm. It has been ever since the decree, the unfunded federal mandate that was the Gideon decision. Will we succeed? I believe we will. I've come to believe that the work underway to comply with the MOA is actually good news for this community. It's as good news for us now as it was when a public defender was established back in 1917. There is a deep commitment to justice here. I think this commitment is deep and enduring. I believe we establish justice when we reduce detention and its harms. We establish justice when we treat kids as kids. When we divert children from the justice system whenever possible when we ensure equal treatment and due process, when we balance youth development with personal accountability and public safety. So I make these commitments to myself and on behalf of the public defenders that I'm privileged to serve with as we march toward our 100th anniversary in 2017. I ask my colleagues within the juvenile justice system to make the commitment with me that we all do the hard work now that will restore public trust in the integrity of our court system for generations to come. When we achieve and sustain independent, ethical, and zealous advocacy for all children, we will have dismantled the dangerously structured dams here in Memphis. Justice needs to mean something here in this city. 
In the city where we killed Dr. King, justice needs to mean something other than punishment. Abe Fortas had it right. The right to counsel is the essence of justice. Working together, we can honor the work of Samuel Bates and Abe Fortas. Working together, we can honor the spirit of Dr. King's words. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Here we go. Thank you.